Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Loretta McInnes, and I'm a recently appointed trustee of Cambridge Rare Disease Network. So welcome, everybody, to this afternoon's session. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce to you our next speaker. Her name is Georgina Windsor. So, a little bit about Georgina. Georgina lived with four or multiple rare diseases for 20 years before she received an actual diagnosis. She's faced many challenges on this journey, both physical and mental health challenges. But in spite of this, Georgina has forged ahead with life. She studied Mandarin in China before going on to study biological anthropology at the University of Cambridge, a fascinating area of study and one that is the theme of today's talk. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you and welcome Georgina. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to build upon the wonderfully informative talks of my predecessors. So as mentioned, I live with multiple rare diseases and what I would like to do today is introduce you to the topic that I'm passionate about, which is anthropology. And I would like to unite academic perspectives also rooted in my own personal experience. And I think anthropology is a wonderful way to do that. It brings a humanising perspective to science and it's one that I think is wonderful and can offer a brilliant commentary today here at RareFest. So, as mentioned, I'm very passionate about this subject and I think that it offers a really great framework to understand difference, diversity and how we conceptualise our journeys in society, particularly as somebody that's had quite a different journey with multiple rare diseases. So, before I start, I do just want to offer a quick warning that in the beginning 10 minutes of my presentation, there will be some photos of human fossil remains, so if that bothers anybody, just to let you know, that will be in the first 10 minutes. So I wanted to start with this beautiful work behind me. So this is some cave art from the site of Cueva de las Manos in Argentina, and it's dated from around 9,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago, so it was occupied for quite a long time by our ancestors. And I think that it sets the tone for this presentation and it has such a beautiful message behind it of community, of cooperation, of coming together and of diverse perspectives, which I think suits the topic of RareFest absolutely. And coincidentally, it reminds me very much so of the rare disease emblems that we have depicting many coloured hands. And I wonder if that influence was intentional, but it's certainly a message that I would like to draw upon today. So if you don't know what anthropology is, simply put, it's the study of humans. But what we look at is evolution, genetics, physiology, and we draw together perspectives of humans from the very deep past, so like seven million years ago, all the way until now, putting that into the context of answering some really big questions, like, for example, what does it mean to be human? And obviously that's a very big question. The way that anthropology tackles questions like this and what I think makes it so unique is the fact that it draws together so many different lines of evidence. So we look at anything from art to archaeology to historical sources. And I don't know if there's any historians in the room, but I think that... Oftentimes, when we look at history, we look at textual sources, which means that they are biased in the sense that they were often written by leaders or those who had the ability to write. What anthropology does is it brings together many more diverse perspectives about societies so we can tell the stories of all people that lived in the past and we can use that framework to think about the modern day too. So I would like to talk through with you today the question of what it means to be human, and as someone with a rare disease, how I would fit myself into that equation, which is sometimes very difficult in a society that is not always accessible to those that have rare diseases or disabilities. 
So to revisit a quick whistle-stop tour of human evolution, did you know that there were actually many species of humans that lived in the past? So we are a single group, Homo sapiens, but since we split with a common ancestor with chimpanzees, which was approximately seven million years ago, there have been many, and I wondered if anybody wanted to guess how many species of humans we think there have been, at least. Any guesses? Six. Six, five, okay, any more? So, as we know today, there are at least 21, which might surprise you. And this is obviously based on archaeological research, which has its limitations. Fossils don't preserve well. And equally, when we apply ideas of what a species is to fossils, those definitions don't hold up so well. But I'm always surprised at the idea that there were 21 other groups of diverse humans that lived in the past. And many of those humans were very unique in the way that they lived or the way that they looked. So I've included a, a few photos of reconstructions of past humans. And these are some of the, the most popular ones that you might have heard about. So the Neanderthals, possibly, Denisovans, and the other one that is photographed there is Homo naledi. So these are just reconstructions based on genetic and fossil evidence. Organic tissue doesn't preserve well, so we can't say for sure that this is how they looked, but I think they're just beautiful, and it really speaks to the diversity of past human groups. Humans in the past were incredibly diverse, as are we today, and some of them had very unique adaptations, like, for example, robust jaws, like Paranthropus, which allowed them to have very unique diets to survive in dietary niches. And many of our past human groups invented incredible technological innovations, like stone tools, for example, which I've photographed here. And humans overcame many, many challenges to be able to adapt and thrive in their environment. And they did so by sharing ideas and working together. And that's often what anthropologists quote as the human condition. What makes us unique? What makes us human, so to speak? So our species, Homo sapiens, we evolved in Africa about 300,000 years ago and migrated across the globe. And if you look at our species today, a lot has changed and there are many of us. So I believe that we just hit 8 billion as a population, which is a massively high number. It's quite unbelievable, isn't it? And if you think of something that we all have in common, it's not very easy. And I think that that's because diversity is the hallmark of our species. We have our own histories, our own journeys, societies, cultures, beliefs, traditions. And that is something that holds immense value. So anthropologists have often deemed that our cognition or our intelligence is what makes humans unique. And whilst that might be true, I don't think that it tells the full story of humans. We do have amazingly complex brains, but as do many species, like that of the octopus, for example. And moreover, many animals have very unique adaptations that go alongside this cognition. Like, for example, the octopus, which I think might even be a bit cooler than us, possibly. <laughs> um, so I'm not suggesting that humans aren't amazing. Like, after all, I did choose to study them, so I do think that they're very, very incredible and remarkable as a species. But I think that our superpower, so to speak, is perhaps less easy to spot. And plus, our brains work in highly variable ways, and I think any notions of intelligence or intellect just take away from the fact that we all are very different in the way we think, we feel, we process, and that gives us so much insight and so much opportunity to collaborate with each other. So recently, I came across a study, and this was undertaken at Cambridge University here, and it's about people with dyslexia. 
So they quoted that people with developmental dyslexia have very specific strengths relating to exploring the unknown and that have contributed to the successful adaptation and survival of our species. And the reason that they think this is the case is because across multiple domains, those that have dyslexia have excellent visual processing, for example, and memory and spatial planning. And I have actually seen this in action. So with permission, I would like to tell you about my brother, Callum. You can see him on the screen. He was recently nominated the UK Young Coach of the Year Award, and he got this for running a business in parkour. So, OK, I'll explain quickly. Parkour is where you see people running across buildings. However, that's not what they promote in children. They're teaching them in a safe environment how to navigate different obstacles and to have a very fun and dynamic activity as a way to do sport. But the reason he got this award, and I think he excels so much in this field, he is somebody that has dyslexia, and he's able to plan and innovate and be creative in a way that I could never fathom or never do myself. And this even involves, for example, creating 3D models where he'll decide where different pieces of equipment would be most optimal to put in the sports hall. I think he's brilliant absolutely brilliant at what he does. And I think it gives a really important reflection to the deficit-based model we often have around diversity, difference, and different perspectives. I certainly wouldn't call my own condition a superpower, and I have many physical and cognitive differences. I think that they've accompanied immense challenges but at the same time, they have taught me a lot and they have shaped my perspective immensely. They inspired why I wanted to study anthropology. And it's a unique perspective I now have in that spectrum of human diversity. So other scholars have suggested that perhaps our altruism or our care for others is the hallmark of our species. And this is something that we do exceptionally well. And even our ancestors, like the Neanderthals, for example, were doing this in the past, millions of years ago. So we have recent research from Shanadar Cave um, and La Chapelle aux Saintes in France. And at both these sites, we have evidence that our ancestors cared for others with injuries or disabilities or for the elderly. So perhaps our care for others is something that defines our species and that makes us human. And I think it is something that we do very well. So to settle the debate, I did what any good scientist would do. And I decided to consult AI generators to see what they thought what it means to be human would depict. So if you don't know what these generators are, you can access them online, they're open source, and you essentially just tell them a phrase or a few words, and then they will scour the internet and create an artistic depiction based on that. So I just typed in what it means to be human to see what I would come out with. And you can see the derivatives on the screen. <laughs> I think they're quite an interesting collection. The bottom left, I think, is an attempt at diversity, showing that there's many of us. Maybe there's something to be said there. The top right reminds me of all of my least favourite British politicians' faces combined from the last 10 years. Um, and the middle, I think, perhaps speaks to something about the human condition. Anyway, of course, this is just for fun. And these AI generators, of course, inherit our biases, so won't necessarily answer the question of what it means to be human. So if not all this, and with very little help from the AI generator, what is the hallmark of humankind? And what, what most importantly, how does that relate to rare diseases and to being here with you all today and to RareFest? Well, I think that humans are amazing in the following ways. We evolved to be social innovators who work together, build on the ideas of others, communicate in diverse ways, 
bring together our differences and use the material realm to find solutions. And all of this centers around our homework feature, our diversity. Diversity was integral to our ancestors' ability to overcome challenges and to find solutions. It makes us smarter, more creative, more adaptive, and I think it's certainly something to be celebrated. After all, the different facets of insight, thinking, and creativity are sparked from the pool of diversity. And you can see evidence of this in action in the modern day. Humans cooperate in some remarkable ways, and we've achieved some amazing things. So I'll give you some examples. We mapped the entirety of the human genome, which I think is pretty amazing. We help others, neighbors, or nation in times of crisis. And in 2020, the group of humans on the bottom left came together to hold the longest ever recorded usable golf club, which is 51 feet long. <laughs> that actually happened. <laughs> but jokes aside, humans collaborate, and we're brilliant at it. Anthropologists often cite that compared to our closest primate relatives, the reason that we're different in the way we collaborate and the way that we share information is the fact that there are so many of us and that that means we have a lot of connectivity when it comes to our ideas. The more we can see of each other's work, the more we can learn. And that's intuitive and also is the spirit of Rare Fest, like we are all here today for, with the coming together of different scientists, technologies, researchers, patient group and patients alike, so that we can share each other's ideas and build upon them. Numerous studies have also demonstrated this, and I think it's something that makes sense and we all support. But whilst it may be true, I think it doesn't tell the whole story. And there's been some really interesting research recently about how partial connectivity may actually be more adaptive in how we come to solutions. So basically what researchers do is they, they make problem-solving experiments and they had different groups that had full connectivity so they could see everything that each other was doing of their work and then some groups where they couldn't see everything or perhaps a new participant would come in later. And what they found is whilst the groups that had full connectivity would come to very good solutions, the groups that had partial connectivity would often come to more optimal solutions in the long term. And this is because rather than settling upon the first solution, incorpor incorporating more diverse perspectives meant that they had new facets of thinking and eventually would come to more creative solutions. And it might sound intuitive, but I think it's actually a very important distinction. And it's food for thought about how we might expand our horizons when we collaborate. It might inform whose perspectives we decide to bring in on that process. For example, the person with the rare disease you're researching, rather than just others that are researching in the field. Or perhaps even the person that has an entirely different an opposite methodology to you that you don't necessarily agree with, but actually might bring value to consider. And to make diverse perspectives heard, I think it brings to the core of the issue that we have to give others a platform. We have to make that accessible and understand the forms of communication of others, and most importantly, find ways to reach out and to make their ideas feel valued and feel important. So bringing this all together, I think that anthropologists have had a lot to say about the evolution of humans and what it means to be human. And as someone with a rare disease, I've really struggled to fit myself into all of those definitions and what they mean, especially when sometimes I feel alienated and it's hard to conceptualize my, myself in a world that's often inaccessible to us with rare diseases, and sometimes sports deficit-based models about our abilities. I don't believe that anybody owes a contribution to society. We have the right to just exist. 
But given the chance, rare and disabled voices often have much to say, and there's a lot that we would like to contribute. And there's so much that you can learn from us. We often have a unique perspective on the world because we've seen its challenges. We've seen a different side to it. An integral component which makes this species amazing is our diversity and our difference. And I think that that's something anthropologists would really benefit from recognizing. It helped us to adapt and to overcome challenges. And I really think that it will be the forefront of our future too. When I think about humans in the past overcoming challenges by working together and caring for others, it makes me feel really hopeful about the future. I'm excited to see what it holds for us. And the insights of anthropology remind us that in doing so, we must draw upon our diversity, our aptitude for collaboration, and our inclusion of the ideas of others. And I believe that that's what Rarefest is all about. And I, I think it's such a pleasure to be here. I feel like an anthropologist of the, the modern day, witnessing something really amazing going on around me. But most of all, as someone with a rare disease, when I think about what it means to be human, and I look at humans of the past, I feel hope. Anthropology taught me to embrace my diversity and my difference as one of my most valuable resources. And it's made me very passionate about using my voice and of raising the voices of others. And do I think that rare and disabled voices should be at the forefront of the future of humankind? Absolutely, I do. Thank you for listening, and it's a delight to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Georgina. Do we, we have some time for questions? There is so, so much diversity. Um, we are actually, so maybe the second biggest problem we are facing at the moment after climate change is loss of biodiversity. So could, could there be some sort of uh, contribution made by, by in, in terms of human diversity in, in the preservation of biodiversity as a, as a kind of... Um, I don't know, if, if we are able to preserve human diversity, could there also be some benefit in, in broader mm, diversity? So if, if diversity is the kind of the, the, the that we can excel in. <clears throat> Absolutely, I think it's a, a really important issue. And when we talk about diversity, I've spoken more about ideas and values and collaborations but there are also multiple levels that that works at, for example, genetic diversity. And I find it very interesting that humans, we actually lack genetic diversity in a massive way. So even though we all look very different and we behave very differently, our genes are almost identical compared with other species. So I think it's really about thinking about those different levels. And that's why when we think about what makes humans unique, it's often our ideas, our behaviour and our cognition that's cited as something that's unique. And I do think that we should be using that to think about really important issues like protecting the world's bioculture and our heritage. And there are many parts of the world that are massively endangered and possibly even unexplored, like, for example, the deep depths of our sea. Um, but I think it's remarkable that for a species that works so well together, we're often not terribly good at solving big problems. <laughs> so I think that, that that's food for thought, and we should think about why that might be the case. Thank you for your talk. I'm curious as to how your experience as a student of biological anthropology has influenced your advocacy and your outlook on the rare disease community broadly. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I got diagnosed with my rare diseases just before I decided to transfer to anthropology. Before that, I was actually looking more at politics and social sciences as something I wanted to study. I think what it meant for me is when I got diagnosed, immediately I had to start thinking about really big questions in the world that I hadn't necessarily 
tackled before, and that wasn't necessarily my choice, but it was very valuable. And as soon as you start to have a perspective where perhaps you feel different or you feel alienated, it equally gave me an ability to take a step back. And as you say, like talking to aliens, for example, that is what anthropology often aims to do, is to take the outlook where you step away from your biases. So I think that's where my passion sparked from. And I think what anthropology has given me is just lots of frameworks to think that through with. It's a very dynamic subject, and, and I really do love it. <laughs> well, I think we want to say thank you very much, Georgina, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I think it's stimulated lots of thoughts, lots of discussion, and uh, we wish you well in your, in your journey. Thank you. Thank you.